Okay, uh, hello everyone. This is uh, Nico Nico. I'm the assistant principal, as Andy said, for uh, transition in Doha College. I'm also the deputy head of primary um, at Doha College as well. So this this presentation will be focused on our primary um, area of the school, and we have with us Derek. Yeah, good morning everyone. My name is Derek Watson. Um, I'm the phase leader for year five and six, I'm responsible for the pastoral and academic progress uh, and care for the children in year five and six. I've been at Doha College for a number of years now um, and I'm delighted to be joining you this morning. Um, we're looking today at how data is used um, at Doha College across all levels, um, in particular how it supports our teaching and learning. So our aims for today, hopefully by the end of this webinar, you'll have an overview of how we ensure each stakeholder sees the relevant data and we'll talk you through how we use the GL um, education assessments to do that. Uh, we're particularly looking at uh, the new group reading test um, which we implemented uh, last year for the first year and how that supports our teaching and learning um, within our reading and in particular looking at the interventions that we put in place to support um, literacy across all areas of, of um, the reading but also our EAL um, specific children and then we'll also look at the progress test reports that we use and the rationale behind behind our use of those and how we use them and in particular how that's been used to replace um, SATs at transition. To make sure that you get a full holistic view of the assessments that we use, we'll also talk about the PASS assessment and the CAT4 assessments and how they feed into what we're doing um, from an academic point of view. So myself and Derek will, will move between the two, but Derek's going to start by talking through um, the new group reading test and the progress tests. We'll just give you a little bit of context about the school first. So we are a British Curriculum International School in Doha, Qatar, which is in the Middle East. Um, we've been around and established for almost 40 years. Over the last few years, our school has increased quite drastically, um, particularly in our primary school. We were traditionally, five years ago, we were a six form entry secondary with a small two form entry primary school on, um, on one campus. And five years ago, at the at request of the ministry, we then expanded and had a um, additional campus added, which then brought our primary school to a six form entry primary across two campuses. So we currently now have just over 2,000 students uh, of both genders in a 3 to 18 setting. And in primary particularly, we have six forms of entry across two campus um, with just over 1,000 students ranging from 3 to 11 years old. So there's been a real need in the last few years to look at our assessment processes and how we are adapting those and um, to meet the needs of a, a much larger cohort of students. One of the other uh, key contexts that we have at Doha College is we're delighted to, to have been awarded the first high performance learning school um, anywhere in the world. Um, and that is a, a huge programme of uh, school improvement that we've undertaken over the last couple of years. Um, and it's very hard to distill down into um, very hard to distill down into a couple of key messages, but we've got a couple of uh, things that we can draw together. Basically, at the heart of high performance learning is a belief in an equity based model of education, which fits perfectly with the mastery agenda and a belief that almost all children can achieve high performance and age related expectations. Um, and that's absolutely fundamental to, to our beliefs at Doha College and how we do things. Um, uh, just before we go into to the uh, what we're going to be doing, um, it, it's interest, just interesting to put into context why that HPL and us becoming a high performance learning um, school was paramount to the decisions that we made. As Derek said, we, we're talking about having uh, ticking a lid off of our, our children's learning, and in particular, our investigation into the GL assessments was around the NGRT, and that was our initial. Um, step into inquiry. Um, we have uh, we explored the NGRT 
particularly because it was adaptive and we were we were moving away from national curriculum leveling at the time and looking for alternative ways to assess the children and and as you'll see uh, through uh, Derek's explanation we were looking for rigorous assessments that created adaptability and we were looking for also ways in which to internationally benchmark our children against um, the international uh, market so the next next few slides, Derek's going to take you through our progress test uh, series and how we use that um, within the school, and then on to the NGRT. Uh, thank you, Nicola. So we moved away from SAT for a number of reasons. Um, from my own educational background, I come from Scotland, as you maybe gather from my accent, um, where that form of uh, assessment is not prevalent. And being an international school, we have an element of choice over the type of assessments we conduct at the end of key stages. And one of the key problems that we had was, along with many schools who undertake SATs uh, as a measure at the end of a key stage, we found that our curriculum was becoming extremely narrow by the time we got to January, February in year six and in year two, as our teachers started to prepare children for these assessments um, and to give them a, a good chance of doing well in those. Also, one of the problems that was very specific to um, Doha College was because we have an extremely engaged and active parent body, we were finding that our children, particularly in year six, were undertaking several additional hours of study with a private tutor per week. And you can imagine the type of pressure that our 10 and 11 year olds were feeling at that time. And we were just totally unhappy with that. And when we marry that with the context that Nicola's outlined of being a high performance learning school where mastery is at the heart of our curriculum, it was totally at odds with what we believed great quality education looked like. So we were on the lookout for an alternative and some of the key things we were looking for in that alternative was that it had to measure progress against the national curriculum objectives for the age, uh, for the programme of study for that year group and also um, it reduced the level of preparation and stress that children were undertaking but it also maintained accountability for staff so that when we undertook our end of key stage two assessments as the phase leader for year five and six, I was still accountable for the attainment at the end of that phase and at the end of the key stage to present to Nicola as our deputy head and, and line manager for key stage two, to our head of primary, the principal of the school and then the governor. So that, that accountability was absolutely free. And that's why the progress test fitted for us because the progress test is a measure against the programme of study for year six. Um, it's computer based, so the level of preparation that's undertaken for that is completely minimum. And because we've broken away from SATs completely, our parents feel that the curriculum is still broad and balanced. Our children get a great diet of, uh, of experiences in year six all the way through. And the number of hours of extra tutoring is not happening because we also don't have an entrance test from primary to secondary. Um, one of the things that's ongoing currently in our year sixes is the spending the they're spending five weeks towards the end of this term preparing for the production, which they're having absolutely terrific fun. They're learning a whole variety of different skills. And if we still had the pressure of SATs there, it's something that we just simply wouldn't be undertaking at this time of year. So that's the first thing. It's linked to the curriculum and it helps to remove um, the pressure for students and it keeps accountability for staff. Now, in terms of the progress tests, what they assess is the curriculum content of the national curriculum. So within maths, the curriculum content of number, ratio and proportion, geometry, measurement, statistics and algebra are all still in there. In terms of the processes, as we know, we've got fluency, reasoning and problem solving as key aspects of the national curriculum. And the only change there from the national curriculum programme of study is that fluency is split into two sections, where you have fluency in facts and fluency in conceptual uh, reasoning, conceptual understanding, sorry. And the basic difference there is the fluency in facts is the rapid recall of number facts, whereas the, the fluency of conceptual understanding is using that speed of recall in a problem situation to, develop, to demonstrate your skill within that mathematical um, concept. And that's really important. In terms of English, the aspects that are uh, assessed using the progress test is the content of spelling, grammar and punctuation, also comprehension for narrative and non-narrative. Um, and then within the comprehension, you've got the retrieval, simple inference, complex inference, and authorial technique, which are linked to the national curriculum objectives 
and also the subject content domains for reading. Alongside that has to sit an independent writing assessment um, and what we do at Doha College is we develop a writing portfolio across the year um, which is then looked at using um, the national curriculum objectives which we have in-house broken down um, to be rubrics to show whether a child is working at the age-related expectations or beyond. Um, and that's a kind of rounded picture of how we assess at the end of Key Stage 2. In terms of the data that we generate from this, we have several different levels. We've obviously got individual pupil level and class level, and that is shared with individual class teachers, and I'll discuss that a little bit later on how we do that. We then have our year group data, which again is discussed with class teachers, their heads of year, and myself, where we look at trends across a year group, and we look at what we can impact based on those results. We then look at phase data, which I would look at with both of the heads of year from year five and six, and with Nicola as the deputy head responsible for key stage two. And then we look at the whole school data, um, which would be a primary leadership group um, discussion uh, and beyond. So when we get the, the results back, uh, apologies if you've used these tests before, but I'll just talk you through what it actually looks like. And this slide shows you a snapshot of the progress test report that you get back. You can see that in the first column you have the student name and that's fairly self-explanatory and then you've got the tutor group which would be the class. Uh, an important thing depending on the data analysis you undertake in your school is the age at the test, the time of test, because that could allow you to start to analyse trends for September birthdays, for August birthdays and to look at trends there. You've then got the number of, a que number of questions attempted so you can see if a child has got to the end. There were 50 questions in the bracket, so that's the number of questions in the assessment, and each of the two children shown in this example have, have, have attempted the 50 questions. That's where you could see if a child scored low, they've possibly not had time to finish, and you can do some further analysis. Um, one of the key components um, for us at Doha College is the standardised age score, and this is another reason why we are so um, such advocates for these types of assessments, because as Nicola's outlined in the context earlier, we are an outstanding school, we are academically selective, we take in exceptionally bright children and we get great results. And it doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to work out that that might be the case. But what we are really interested in at Doha College is being reflective and it builds on as part of our, our uh, drive to be a high performance learning school and to be world class. And what we are really interested in is the results that children achieve but also how much value we add on to children. So when we get children coming into our school, what are the standardised age scores and what value are we adding on to those children as they progress through the school? So that's a key component. Um, you've got the, the chart in the middle which shows the confidence bands and that basically shows you that on a good day, what would they perform at the top of the, of the I can't remember, that's uh, whiskers and tails, the top of the, t the, the whiskers and what would they perform at on a bad day at the bottom of the whiskers and then the dot is what they've performed that on the day. You've also got the staining, which tells you the percentage they sit in, the national percentile rank, which tells you where they sit in terms of the national averages for the UK. You've got the, the group rank, which is really useful if you want to rank the children in your class or your year group by performance. And you've got an old national curriculum level there that we don't actually use. Um, one of the key things is... Um, is that we can link this to the scaled scores for SATs when we get the results. Um, and that's really important. So we asked GL for a breakdown of what the comparator would be, and that allowed us to, to look at how we assess. So that was a really key indicator as well. Um, and basically, the, the big thing with the progress test is we do ongoing assessments, both formative and summative, through Doha College. And what these allowed us to do was validate the judgments we were arriving at. We didn't have many big surprises when we undertook these assessments, but they did allow us to validate our judgments. Um, when we get all that data back, we then, of course, award end-of-key stage judgments for children, but we also analyse the data. Um, and as we look through the data, um, you can see I've got a number of charts here. The first one is an analysis of English. And what you can see is our year sixes compared to the national average in England. And the solid um, curved line that you can see in the middle of the chart is the average. The blue bars are our boys and the pink bars are our girls. And what you can see is that for, um, for our learners in year six last year, 
they had an exceptional performance. They performed very, very highly, and we were really pleased with that. In terms of when we started to drill down, we realised that there was quite a difference between girls' attainment and boys' attainment on general, although boys performed better at higher end. And based on that, in consultation with Nicola as the deputy from Key Stage 2, we made some key changes to our English curriculum for this year because this is last year's results. Um, we looked at buying in some different texts to initiate an English mastery approach, and we made sure that those texts that we invested in, we already had some boy-friendly texts, but we made sure the ones that we subsequently invested in were very engaging for our, our boy learners. We bought Arrowhead, we had Stormbreaker, we've invested in Percy Jackson, and that's all part of our strategy of analysing this data and making sure we put things in place to ensure equity for all of our learners. Um, we also began to look at we also began to look at um, we also began to look at the analysis of mathematics, um, and when we looked at that, our, our scores again were fantastic. But I showed you a different chart here. This is a breakdown of the different areas that are assessed within mathematics. And although we scored very well in that, what we noticed was that our score in terms of the fluency in facts and procedures was much closer to the UK average. Um, than it was for the other aspects of the mathematics assessment. So some of the key changes we brought in there were we focused on mental calculation um, and how we developed that across Key Stage 2 and the school in general. We'd also built on part of a, an initiative that was going on um, already where we invested heavily in a Numicon approach so that we developed the concrete pictorial and abstract approach to develop the understanding behind the fluency in facts and procedures to then improve speed and accuracy. Um, and those those initiatives are ongoing at Doha College this year, and hopefully we'll see uh, an impact of those in our progress test data this year. One of the other things that the progress test allowed us to do was to compare ourselves against the UK average and against an international average. And that's something that as a, a leading international school, in particular our top tier management and also our governors are really interested in because that gives them something really tangible to understand how well the school is performing. So again, the, the data we got from GL allowed us to compare our children in year six and how they did in mathematics compared to the UK average, compared to the international average, and then again for the English schools. And one of the things that actually surprised us was our English scores were higher than our math scores because traditionally our math scores have been higher than our English scores with the way we'd been assessing. So that was a nice validation of the work that we'd undertaken, uh, we'd undertaken in those. As Nicola already outlined, the, the first assessment that we looked at um, was the NGRT, and this was used as a this is used as a termly checkup um, in terms of our reading progression. And we take the standardised age scores and the, the percentile ranks and uh, have a conversion chart for how we assess them in terms of whether we believe they're emerging, developing, secure or mastered within the programme of study for their curriculum. There are the three aspects to the NGRT um, and they are based on a pyramid because the comprehension is the last skill that they look at depending on the performance within the assessment. It starts off looking at phonological awareness then the and develops the mechanics of reading to look at phonics and decoding, and then it looks at comprehension. And one of the key aspects of this was, as Nicola detailed earlier, these are computer adaptive assessments, and that is really important for us because it means that none of our learners get that feeling that they can get in a SAT paper where they're just stuck. Because what the computer adaptive aspect means is that as a child undertakes the assessment, their chronological age is fed into the system and it starts off with a question similar to the chronological age. If they get that correct, then the questions get harder and harder and harder until they get three wrong and then it takes it back a level. And through a process of elimination, it then starts to work out a reading age for the children. Um, and this, this, I have to say, has been extremely successful for us. Um, it dovetails nicely with a Reader Inc. programme and it gives our teachers validation for their judgments within reading and I think that's a really important thing again because although we use these scores to help give assessment judgments they're not used in isolation they're also used with our whole class guided reading lessons 
our reading assessment checkups and how children are progressing through content domains, etc. So it's a holistic picture and this fits in really well with that. It also fits in well with our high performance learning agenda because it gives all the children the equity within the assessment, but it doesn't put a lid on their learning because we have year sixes who are getting um, age scores of 18 and 16 and 17 on the reading scores. So it really allows us to see their full potential. And that's really, really important for us. It's also digital. So when the, the climate we work in, and we know that delivering these assessments in terms of paper is a workload issue for staff. These are really easy for staff to administer. And it's the same with the progress test. We have a, an IT team who work out all the access to codes, feed that all onto the system. And then all our staff have to do is administer the assessment. We let our IT team know that the assessments have been completed. And then reports are sent through, generally speaking, within an hour or two. It's extremely quick. Um, and that is really, really important because it reduces workload for staff and they can then spend most of the time that would be in the administration of that looking at their bank of evidence and comparing it to the assessment rather than marking assessments. So that fits in really, really well with what we're, what we're looking to do. It also allows us to track value added um, and where the when we really drill down into that, what teaching and learning approaches have we used across a term that are adding value? What topics are we teaching? What texts are we teaching that are engaging children and adding value? And we can also look at a child's performance over time. Um, and that longitudinal view of assessment is really, really important. Uh, and building on from that, what this next slide shows, it shows our six classes and it shows what their NGRT term, the, for each of the classes, our classes are labelled yellow, red, purple, orange, green, blue, and then we have the overall. And what you can see is within yellow, the first bar is their NGRT standardised age score average for the class. The second bar is their standardised age score for the class at the end of term three. So what you can see is not measuring progress in curriculum outcomes, but the standardised age score has improved in every class. And what that shows us is that across the year, in year five, we are adding quite a bit of value to our children. And that's a real validation for us in terms of what we're undertaking in the class, the changes that were made, etc., cetera, um, and how those initiatives are working out. It also allows us to see the classes that are adding the most value. And that's not meaning that those are better teachers. What it does is it allows us to put a spotlight on what's going on in that class, what strategies are being successful, and it gives us a bit of a story. So we can see that in terms of um, year five, the classes in purple and green added a lot of value last year. So that then led to observations, peer support, so that all of the practitioners had a chance to see what was going on in those classes, to analyse what's gone well, to share the practice, and it gave us a really, really good basis for some peer moderation in terms of a reading um, in terms of our reading assessments. The NGRT also feeds into what we do at Doha College that we call our PPMs, our Pupil Progress Meetings. And the Pupil Progress Meetings are meetings that are held four times a year. We hold them at the start of Term 1 with the class teacher. Um, phase leader, sorry, holds them with the class teacher at the start of Term 1, end of Term 1, end of Term 2, end of Term 3. And this is where we go through each curricular area, reading, writing, maths and science, and we drill down into the very baseline data. We look at an individual learner's performance in each class and we track where they sit on our score of um, emerging, developing, secure and mastered. And this is the picture for the end of term one in one of our classes um, uh, within year six. And we start to identify the learners who are not making progress, we are a cause for concern and we put interventions in place for those. When you look at our learners who are a cause for concern, they are not all our lowest attainers. Some of them are the children who we haven't added value to. And the reason they become a cause for concern is because we're not adding value. So we don't necessarily put an intervention in place. In some cases, you can see in the bottom um, right hand corner, we've put them on a monitoring list where it's a case of, OK, they're performing well. We haven't added value. We just need to keep an eye on those learners and make sure that that's not a, that's not a picture that's, that's stagnant and that we're monitoring that progress. 
Um, I won't drill down into this too much, but the data feeds very much into this. And as we are looking at the reading data in particular, we are sitting with the NGRT scores in front of us. We're looking at the performance in terms of the year group, in terms of their class, and we're also looking at the class-based evidence and how they're performing day-to-day -day in the reading lessons and in the literacy lessons. Um, and there's a lovely story about the, the impact of interventions that came based on this. And we had one learner who came into this particular class uh, in year six who had a standardised age score on the NGRT of 89 at the end of year four, uh, year five, sorry. And as they came into year six and we held their initial PPM, we knew that that was a learner who needed significant input and intervention. So they took place in it. They took part in our Fresh Start program, which is a phonics recovery program that incorporates um, decoding, encoding, and aspects of comprehension. It's really intensive. It takes place over six weeks. So this learner took part in that, roughly 45 minutes a day in school, this extra intervention work. And at the end of term one, this learner went from a standardised age score within reading of 89 to 110. And what that allowed us to do was give a real validation to that learner for the hard work. But also we now know the efficacy of that intervention and the, the power of that intervention is such that we can then widen that and pick up some of our other learners um, and that's really, really important for us. Um, and I'm just going to pass you over to Nicola for PASS. Okay. Um, so PASS is, a, is something that we were approached to um, trial um, last year by GL um, Education Assessments. And it, it tied, and the reason we, we took it on is that it tied in beautifully with our um, drive to be a high-performance learning school. Um, and it, the, the reason behind that is that um, as a HPL school, we're looking at the values, attitudes and attributes of the students. And the past survey was a great way for us to begin to unpick that and look at it in a quantifiable way. Um, so the PASS um, itself stands for Pupils' Attitudes to Self and School, and it's a, it's a survey, it's an online psychometric measure, which is there to support pupil well-being. Um, we decided to uh, trial it in our Key Stage 2 classes, although it is, it is, there is a Key Stage 1 availability, and actually we ran this out throughout um, the whole school. And it really did provide us with an insight into what students felt about themselves, their learning, and their teachers and how they compare themselves to others. And the past survey looks at nine different factors that are highlighted there on the slide, um, ranging in everything from how they feel about school to their own level of confidence and their own self-regard as a, as a learner. Um, and so we, we trialled that for the first time last year, really to help um, give us a snapshot and an insight into each of those factors and where we could, again, add value and support for those students. So this is what it looked like um, for us at the end, as a key stage two overall. Um, and as you can see, the, each of the um, factors are outlined there, and it gives you a percentage rating in terms of uh, whether, the, whether we got a positive response. And overwhelmingly, what we found was we did. We got a very positive response. Um, so that in itself didn't necessarily provide any um, anything that we didn't already already know um, but what it did do is highlight in particular factors that as a school we wanted to take another another look at so in particular our um, scores for factor three on the self-regard as a learner were lower than the other the other factors and whilst looking at some of the case studies that GL have produced, that was a, a common trend, particularly in an international circuit. It was something that we wanted to look at and highlight and see as we develop as a, as a high performance school, we were, able, we were able to shift. So having that focus on the pastoral side of um, our, our student approach and whether or not we are um, enabling the children to reflect as a learner and what it did bring about was a discussion about whether or not we as a school had had put too much of an emphasis on them being self-critical and self-aware and whether or not we needed to uh, channel that in a more positive light to ensure that they were really reflecting on the amazing work that they are doing in the school and seeing it as a positive rather than constantly tri striving for um, greatness and not necessarily re recognizing um, how far they had come as learners. 
Um, interestingly, we, as we looked at this data across the whole school, in up to our um, up to our 18-year-olds, our, our key, sta uh, key stage five learners, those percentages did not shift dramatically. So it did. It, what, what we got from that was that across the school, those areas that had the least positive response, which was the self-regard as a learner and also the response to curriculum demands, were consistent, which shows as a school that we just need to look at either, either of those um, points to ensure that um, we are we're, we're tackling any, any needs. Um, it really did help us establish what students felt about the school and their perception. It helped us as staff to challenge our own assumptions about the school. And what uh, and what necessarily we felt, and whether or not that reflected with the students. Um, and in a moment on the next slide, we'll look at also how it led to improvements and needs that were identified by the students. So, on the next slide here, you can see what the breakdown of that data looks like. So, um, obviously the names have remained anom anonymous, but as you can see, that this is a a breakdown of the data. And there's lots of red flags there. Uh, and just to put into context, this data um, is, a, is a sample data across the whole of one of our year groups. And the data that's been selected there is, is deliberately unpicked those students that have got either a, in terms of a RAG rating, of either an amber or a red response. So whilst there is a, a few children there, that's over a cohort of 140, um, where, where the others were all uh, green or, or yellow and these this data was highlighted and shared with the phase leaders to discuss at the pupil progress meetings that Derek mentioned earlier just to highlight that when you have when staff are having those conversations about pupil attainment and um, whether or not they are uh, making that they've got value added whether or not they are um, making progress or, or standing stagnant and um, that they took this into consideration from a pastoral side to see how they are perceiving themselves in the school and whether or not that had a direct impact on their attainment. And what came out um, was that we, we occasionally have vulnerable students. We have students that are maybe not attaining well and are overconfident, therefore not recognising where they need support. And on the flip side of that, children that are particularly um, high attaining, but because of their own self-confidence, um, aren't or weren't aware necessarily of how high they were achieving. Um, and to give you, uh, just to put that into, into a, an actual example, what we had um, was a student um, in, in, it was in a secondary um, part of the school, who was a very, um, very high attaining, very engaged student, uh, came into school happy, really on the, out, on the outside um, appeared to be a, a model student. But through doing the PAR survey, what came out was that actually had a very, very negative view of himself and the school. Um, and through conversations, what came out was that actually the, the, the student themselves was, were, was really struggling with friendship circles and had been a, a relatively new member of the school and just hadn't formed those bonds and those relationships that were enabling him to um, fully succeed within the school. Um, so it, it very quantifiably we were able to action that and and it, it proved as a, a real strength to our pastoral, t pastoral side. Um, as I said previously, it's also allowed us to create bigger pictures across the school and look at where we can work collaborative, collaboratively on joint projects between primary and secondary in order to address um, some of those areas of, of less, um, less interest. Um, moving on from the past survey and and our use of that. I just wanted to, before we before we finish, just to outline how we use the CAT4 assessments. Now, CAT4 assessments are, are not new to us here at Doha College. We've used them for a, a significant number of years. Um, and for those of you that this is the unfamiliar with CAT4s, it, it, it's an assessment that provides um, an assessment over the four batteries that are outlined there, verbal reasoning, nonverbal, spatial and quantitative reasoning. Um, it's a, an online electronic assessment and we, we use those throughout our secondary school um, to support with grade predictions, etc. 
But for us in primary, it forms part of our admissions process. And the reason that we use CAT4 assessments is it, it's a very, um, quite a quick and effective way of identifying strengths and areas of weakness across uh, across a, a student's ability. Um, we carry those out as part of the admissions process. And historically, when we've looked at that data, what we have looked at is this overall mean that you can see in the blue. Um, so we've looked at those as, a, as a, an average across the across the four batteries and use that to support our judgments along with some other assessments, uh, in particular a writing assessment. And through conversations with GL um, when we were investigating the NGRT, what became very evident was that we weren't looking at the batteries as effectively as we could have done. Um, and as as we are an international school, we often have children that come that have that speak multiple languages and looking at each of those batteries independently as well as the overall score allows us to see the potential in students that might not necessarily come through through their level of English and as you can see they've just highlighted in in red where we've got we had one student that had a, a relatively or comparatively low verbal score but when we look at their non-verbal um, which was was significantly higher it gives us a much clearer picture about the potential that a student might have um, and allow us to see that in a, in, a, in a very quick and easy way. So we now use those CAT4 assessments um, as part of our admissions assessment. And as I say, we look at all four batteries rather than just the overall average to make sure that we've got a real true and clear reflection of, um, of the students that, that are um, coming into the school. So just as a summary there, just to highlight really of, of what we use and how we use it, um, and as both myself and Derek have talked you through, the NGRT we use from age one to six and it's termly and it's used to track our value added and identify areas of support and intervention and that's shared by the middle leaders and class teachers. Um, progress test is year, will be used this year in year two, four and six off the back of the success of its use last year and we're rolling it out to also our year four cohort and um, to get clear um, evidence-based data at each um, of our key stage points. A pass assessment, we're currently going through our um, pass assessments for this academic year and we've, we've shifted the time frame of that just to allow um, a more accurate view of, of the students and how they view the school at a, at a secure point in the school year and that's across our key stage two and beyond and then just to re reaffirm the CAT4 assessments year three upwards as part of our admissions process and does help support identifying EAL students and their potential beyond their current level of English. So I think that's everything from me. Anything you want to add, Derek? No, that's me as well. Thank you.